in verse 19, and we'll conclude today at verse 30. Heavenly Father, we need your help. We need it desperately. If we are going to understand the scriptures, we need the author of these scriptures, the spirit of the living and true God, to show us the intent of what we're reading, the purpose of what we're reading, and the end results of what we're reading. We need to understand it, Lord. So help us. Strengthen us in our faith today. Help the pastor. Help him to be used by you. Let your hand be resting upon him. Give him utterance in the Holy Ghost. Help him to speak as an oracle of God. In Jesus' precious name, amen. Verses 19 through 24. Apostle Paul here in Philippians is actually going to use himself and in particularly Timothy and Epiritus to give us an example or an illustration of everything, how it looks for everything that he just got done teaching. How does it look in practical life? How does it look in practical life? He told us to work out our salvation in fear and trembling. He told us to live blameless, uh, harmless lives without, re re with, without rebuke in this world. Uh, that we are to shine as the stars of heaven above. And he says, what does that look like? So he's going to tell us a little bit about how that looks like. Though he is, he is doing it in a, in a fashion where he's commending Timothy and he's giving praise to Epiritus. At the same time, he never leaves what he's talking about. Always remember, when Paul says something, he doesn't take off and go on to a new topic Bingo. He's always building. He's a building block person. And so in verse 19, he says, I trust in the Lord Jesus to send Timothy to you shortly. Why does he want to do that? Because he's concerned for them. Here you find evidence of a true minister. He's always concerned about the flock. He's always concerned about Christ's people. He's not a wolf in sheep's clothing that kind of acts like he's concerned about you, but in reality, he's concerned about what you can give him. No, a true minister is not concerned what you can do for them. A true minister is concerned about what he and others with him, along with, obviously, the Holy Spirit, can do for you. So he says, but I trust in the Lord Jesus, which is, an, uh, which is a unique phrase. I trust in the Lord Jesus to send Timothy to you shortly. He's showing us here that he has this in his heart to do, but he wants to do it in the will of God. He doesn't want to do anything outside of the head of the church, the Lord Jesus. So he says, I trust in the Lord Jesus. Notice what he doesn't say, like most charismatics say, the Lord showed me and the Lord told me. You don't find that a lot in his writings. There's a few times that you see it, but very few. And you ought to see it because he's being used by the Lord to put down scriptures. But I'm here to tell you if, you, if you as a Christian or you as a Christian around other Christians are always hearing this phrase, the Lord told me and the Lord showed me, most likely without you knowing it, you are being misled. Because I used to do that a lot. And why did you used to do it a lot, Pastor? Because I was around pastors and ministers that did it a lot. I was around Christians that did it a lot. And when I became a pastor... And these people would come to me and say, the Lord told me, the Lord showed me, the Lord this, the Lord that. 99.9% .9 of the time it was off. And what a lot of times what a person might be saying is they, they have a feeling. And that feeling, they're taking that too far and saying, the Lord told me, the Lord showed me. The best thing to do is to say, I sense perhaps... The Lord may be leading, may be leading me, may be leading me this way, may. You better give yourself a door because he may not be leading you. Here's the great apostle Paul say, I trust in the Lord Jesus. What's he trusting? He's trusting in the Lord Jesus that what he feels in his heart that he'd like to do would be affirmed by the Lord and the Lord would support it. So in other words, he's saying that the center of my life is Christ. I don't... My life is not my own. I don't make up my own mind and make up my own decisions when it comes to matters such as this. If I go into the closet and I want to pick a shirt or a pair of slacks to wear that day, that's fine. But when it comes to the things pertaining to the church, the head of the church has to be 
authorizing these things. He has to be approving these things. And you, you become very, very uh, superficial. And you actually become very arrogant when you begin to think you know the will of God about everything. Because it says in the book of James, don't be these people that say, I'm going to go do this and I'm going to go do that. Say, if the Lord wills, I'm going to go do this. And if the Lord wills, I'm going to go do that. That right there tells you that you don't always know the will of God. Now, in the charismatic teaching, there's a teaching about knowing the will of God and being led by the Spirit. And I listen to a lot of that teaching. And some of it is good and some of it is not so good. And the reason why some of it is not so good is people assume that they're being led by the Holy Spirit. They'll go to that verse of Scripture in Romans chapter 8, verse 14. It says, if, we, uh, if you're led by the Spirit of God, you're the sons of God. And that word being led by the Spirit of God there is not in the context of being led like they're teaching. It can imply that, but the substance specifically refers to that if you're minding the things of the Spirit, the things of the Spirit as revealed in the Word of God, and you're wanting to learn about redemption, you're wanting to learn about salvation, you want to learn about the offices of Christ and, and the things that pertain to Christ, it's because you're being led by the Spirit. The Spirit of God is is uh, actuating and prompting that in your life. You're being led that way. And so I just wanted to stop and say that to all of us. Don't get caught up in that. and Don't feel impressed. And let me tell you something. You can be a Christ Christian and want to impress people. How do I know that? Because Jesus warned against it. He says, when you pray, don't impress people. Let them know that you're praying. Just let God know you're praying. When you're giving, don't let everybody know what you're doing when you give. Just let God know what you're doing. And when you're fasting, don't let everybody know what you're doing. Just let God know what you're doing. Okay? And so why does he say that? He's saying that in his disciples right there. Because though you're a disciple, though you're a Christian, you live in a physical body where the principle of sin still abides. And though you are a spiritual individual and you mind the things of spirit and you are one who is a partaker of grace, there still is that side of you that would like and look for expression. And since we came out of the womb as little babies, we wanted to be recognized. And you could be out of the womb 95 years and still want to be recognized because there's something inherent in us and we got to be careful for it. And I know uh, as Christians, a lot of times we want other Christians to feel like we're on fire, that we're spiritual, that rah, 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 we're moving on with God, and that we're something to admire. And you, and you don't want to allow that to be a part of your life. And when you see someone acting like that, that's a Christian, don't criticize them, just pray for them. Because they need your prayers, not your criticism. Your criticism isn't going to help them get out of it. But your prayers will enlist God's help that they might see the truth and set that aside. So verse 19 says, But I trust in the Lord Jesus to send Timothy to you shortly, and that I also may be encouraged when I know of your state. Notice, he says, I want to know your state. I want to know what's going on with you. It really matters to me that you're doing well. Evidence of a true preacher. A true preacher is not concerned about how much money you got for my offering. What can you give me as a gift? A true preacher, and see, the reason I say this, because there's a lot of preachers that are that way. I mean, I've been in their churches. I've heard them talk. I've heard them say things. I'm thinking to myself, this is not good. This is not good. They'll even tell their congregation things they're believing God for. Why are they saying that for? So you will help God bring it to pass by giving them money. There's a lot of wrong things, but a true minister is not concerned about your material wealth or your possessions or anything that you might have that you could share with them. What they're interested in is how are you doing with God? How is it with your soul? Is, is, are you experiencing the work of God's grace? And what are you doing with what you're experiencing? So he was concerned about their state. Now I bring these things up as a pastor. This is pastoral teaching. Because I may not be here forever, okay? 
something might have happened to me, and I'm gone, poof. And you need to look for another pastor or something like that. Or you go to another church. You need to recognize what is a true preacher and what is true about Christians. You need to have a, some discernment about yourself. And be able to divide and separate and not be critical about it, but just be able to recognize it. He goes on to say in verse 20, For I have no one like-minded who will care, sincerely care, not just care, but sincerely care for your state. And that, that's quite a phrase when you say, I don't have anybody like it. I don't have nobody like Timothy. That just shows you that Timothy is really a unique individual in the mind of the Apostle Paul. But when I read something like that, I say, whoa, Lord, if there's anybody that could ever be like Timothy, may I be like Timothy. However you worked in his life, however you developed him to be that kind of an individual, to have those kind of characteristics, may I be that. Well, what was that characteristic that he says, I don't have any other person that like, that's like-minded that will sincerely care for your state, your state, your condition what's going on in your life spiritually that will be sincere about it. And isn't that amazing how he said sincere about it? Not superficial about it? I'll just say this. Most of what I've ever watched in television was not anyone showing any sincerity for the state of someone's life spiritually. I see a lot of superficial baloney from Mahoney. That's what I see. Not trying to drop anything on the Irish there by saying Mahoney. Verse... Verse 21, for all seek their own and not the things which are Christ Jesus. Now, we talked about this, so I won't go into it big time, but it says they all seek their own. In other words, they're all concerned about their own interest and not the interest of Christ. And what are the interests of Christ? The state of the church, the state of the believer. How are they doing with their walk with God? Not many. And that's amazing, isn't it? That's really amazing. We go on. Verse 22. But you know his proven character, that as a son with his father, he served me in the gospel. How did Paul become uh, this person with that, that was so like-minded, like Paul, uh, sincerely caring for the state? How did he come to this place of proven character? Because he served me in the gospel. Serving. The whole Christian life is about serving. The Bible says at one time, before Christ, we were a servant, but we are a servant of sin. And we were a servant of sin, who were we serving? Ourselves. Isn't that right? Now we're servants or slaves of righteousness, and as servants and slaves of righteousness, who are we serving? We're serving the Lord. We're serving God. And in serving God, what's one of the one ways that we serve God? One of, the, one of the ways we serve God is we have a mind for the people that God has a mind for. We have a mind for the people of God that he's called out of darkness into his marvelous light. We have a mind to pray for them. We have a mind to encourage them. We have a mind to assemble and come together with them. We have a mind to stir them up to love and to good works. We have a mind to have an interest in them. We're not just interested in our, me, myself, and I, and my family, us four, no more, as I heard one person say. We're concerned about the believer. We give phone calls. Uh, we ask how we're doing. We drop them an encouraging note or a card. We see them at church and we don't avoid them, but we talk to them, we visit with them. And uh, we find ways to encourage them. Verse 23, he says, Therefore I hope to send him. Notice what he says here. I hope to send him at once. As soon as I see how it goes with me. Uh, you know, I just like this. The reason I like this is there's no charismatic lingo in this ma message. Most preachers and charismatics that I know of would never say, I hope to do it. They're just going to don't do it because they're so presumptuous that they just know what the will of God is. They just know everything. Yeah, I just know everything. You know, I mean, God's all over me and I just got revelation about everything. And that is so superficial and so false. And I'm sorry to say that there was a, a time in my life I was on the, in the edge of that, maybe even beyond the edge of that. Because you have, you have a difficult time not becoming like the people you hang out with. For an example, in 1 Corinthians chapter 15, when Paul's talking about 
the church and uh, about the resurrection of, of our Lord, and he goes through that whole chapter. He says, there's some saying that there is no resurrection. And he goes through all this stuff, and finally he comes down to around verse 33 and 34. And down there he says, do not be deceived. Wrong company corrupts good manners. What's he talking about? When you hang around somebody that's not right, and these individuals weren't right when they were talking about that there's no resurrection. Their teaching was wrong. They were being led by the Spirit, right? But if you hang out, some of the Corinthian church were hanging out with them and chumming around with them. He says, don't be deceived when you do that, that that's not going to rub off on you. He says, Wake, awake unto righteousness and sin not. In other words, don't buy into their lies. Don't buy into that false doctrine because that's a sin. Now, when I was uh, raising my children, I was always careful who my children hung out with. You know, it doesn't take much. You eyeball the neighborhood. You know who the troublemakers are. And the reason for this is, is because I remember before we moved to Bourne Street off of Pennsylvania, I was a pretty good little kid. But when I moved over there, I, I got hooked up with all kinds of people. And I'm telling you what, I went down the tubes really fast. And I can remember there was a, 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 a young girl that moved in that neighborhood, and I heard her say that I never got in trouble until I moved to this neighborhood. My grandma used to tell me, show me who you run with, and I'll show you who you're like. Yeah. President Trump said that to Putin. What are, these country, what are you doing hanging out with somebody like this? Right. And it, it, you got to be careful. You, you can love Christians but you got to be a little cautious if you want to participate in, in fellowship with them and listen to all their stuff and, 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 and go along with it. Before you know it, you're, you're, you're going to get right into it. So he says I, I, he says, I hope to send him soon to you and see how it goes as, I, as, as it goes with me. You mean you don't know how it's going to go with you, Paul? You're the great apostle Paul. Aren't you led by the Spirit? Don't you have light and revelation what's going to happen next week to you? Don't you know? I'm criticizing a lot of the superficial baloney that I have had to endure as a Christian. At the time, I thought it was really spiritual. But a lot of times you think the things you think are really spiritual are just really superficial. That's all it is. And so you need to know that. I know most of you all know that. But I trust in the Lord that I myself will also come shortly to you. No, there he goes again. He's not bragging about how much he knows and where the Lord's at. He says, I trust in the Lord. What's he saying? He's saying, look, I'm not in charge of my life. I do have some desires. Well, brother, you got a desire in your heart. Is that right? Doesn't the scripture say the Lord will give you the desires of your heart? <laughs> that means you're going. See, you can twist scriptures around. People do it all the time. Do the twist. <laughs> Twisting things, Rob. We don't want to do the twist. We want to walk in the light of what the Word of God teaches. But I trust in the Lord Jesus that I myself shall come to you shortly. Now, when he says all this, there's something unique that he's saying. He knows he's in prison. He knows Nero has his number. He knows Nero is in charge, but he does not see Nero in charge. As a Christian, you don't see anybody in charge of your life, ultimately, but the Lord Jesus Christ. That's really amazing to me. Here he is in prison, and Nero's in charge, and no doubt he's heard threats. If you read things he says about himself in prison, he's heard threats about that he's going to die. But he's not concerned about that. He has hope. Even in, under the cloud of threat of death, he knows Nero's not in charge. Now I want to ask you a question. Do you know that the Nero's not in charge? Do you know that the devil's not in charge? Do you know that? Do you know that there's no one in this world that's in charge? 
but your Lord and Savior? And if he was big enough to get, to, uh, to get you out of darkness into his marvelous light, take you out of the kingdom of, of Satan, and put you into the kingdom of his dear son, if he's big enough to do that, don't you think that he's big enough to do whatever he needs to, he needs to do in your life? And always, that gives you a sense of peace and rest when everything around you looks like it's opposed to you and everything that's opposed to you is winning. It looked like Nero was winning. It looked like the prison was winning. It looked like the prison doors were winning. Right? Most people in that situation would have no hope. Paul says, I have hope. Amen. Why? Because Nero's not in charge, but Jesus is. Now, verse 25. Yet I considered it necessary to send to you Eparitus. Eparitus, we'll find out, was sent by the Philippians to Paul to help Paul out. But now he says, I considered it necessary to send to Eparitus, my brother, fellow worker, and fellow soldier, but your messenger, and the one, the one who ministered to my needs, since... He was longing for you all and was distressed because you had heard that he was sick. So what he's saying here is that he came from you to minister to my needs, but I'm, I'm considering sending him back to you because you heard that he was sick and he's been distressed over the fact that you heard that he was sick. And he goes on to say, he'll tell us, in verse 27, indeed he was sick, almost unto death, but God had mercy on him, and not only on him, but on me, lest I should have sorrow upon sorrow. So what do we got going on here? We got Paul concerned for Ephoritus. He wants to cheer him up. He knows he can cheer him up if he goes back and sees all the people that were distressed over him, he knows that he'll cheer the church up if he sends Ephoritus back. But, in the natural, it looked like Paul needed him more than anybody else. So what's he demonstrating here? He's demonstrating, all this stuff is demonstrating this, this development of Christian character that we've been looking at in these first two chapters. Remember in chapter... Uh, 2 verse 4 says let us let each of you look not look out not only for the, your own interest but also the interest of others this is exactly what the apostle Paul is doing right here he re could really use an encourager himself he could really use this person but he looks at you and he says you know what I think you could use them too so if I have a choice between me and you it's going to be you that's really interesting because in verse 5 of chapter 2 he says let this mind be in you which was also in Christ Jesus and talks about the humility of Christ that Christ acted the same way that he could have stayed in glory but he laid all that aside took upon himself a servant became obedient to death even the death of the cross why that we might be reconciled to God that we might have life everlasting and as the Lord would put us above himself Paul now is putting himself or putting the church above himself and see so he's illustrating that all that he's been teaching here is actually being walked out and played out by these three individuals paul timothy and Eparitus. all these individuals he's displaying what he's been teaching and here's something that i want to bring to your attention it says he was sick and he was sick unto death now i had someone tell me, that used to come to this church many years ago, said that if a person's sick, it's because they have sinned against God. They're not repentant. God made them sick. Now, there's scriptures in the Bible talk about if there's some sickly, weakly, and even have fallen asleep. We see that because they have not judged themselves. So that's what they're saying. They're sick because they have not judged themselves. Well, see, you can take one verse of scripture and you can try to build a great big doctrine on top of it, but you've got to balance it with other scriptures. Here's your balancing act right here. Ephoritus. Notice what Paul says about him in verse 25. He's my fellow brother. He's my brother. He's my fellow worker and fellow soldier. And he's a messenger to you who ministers to my needs. 
And when he found out that you were feeling bad, that he was sick, he was distressed over it. Does this sound like a guy that's walking in sin? Does this sound like a guy that doesn't want to get his right, does not want to walk right with God? Does this sound like a guy that if he missed it, he wouldn't, easy, he wouldn't quickly say, Lord, forgive me? And let me tell you something right here about forgiveness. Well, I'm just talking about it right here. There's a difference between a non-Christian and a Christian when they sin. A non-Christian is in the flesh, enmity in his heart against God, not subject to the law of God, and neither indeed can be. That's the non-Christian. He's called a transgressor and a lawbreaker. Okay? The Christian is not under the law. The Christian is not under the dominion of sin. The Christian is under grace. The Christian is in Christ Jesus and no condemnation. The Christian is in a relationship with God. Now, what's the t difference between the two when they sin? When this one sins over here, the non-Christian, it's much like when you're in your car and you're going too fast and you break civil law. All of a sudden, here comes the lights and someone's going to pull you over because you violated or transgressed civil law. And you're under the condemnation of that civil law until that debt is settled, right? The Christian is not under the law. It cannot come under the law. It has, by the body of Jesus Christ, the Bible says in Romans 7, 4, we became dead to the law. That we might be married to another. We're married to the Lord Jesus Christ. We're in a relationship with God. We know him as our father and we have fellowship with him. Now, when we sin over here, we're never called a transgressor. We're called sinners. We're not called transgressors. We're called sinners. That's unique. Because a transgressor always is associated with the thought of breaking the moral law of God. Over here, we sin. When we sin over here, is, uh, when we sin over here, we simply have to do the same thing that Rob has to do with Dana. He acts up, does something wrong. What's he say? I'm sorry. They don't look at each other and say, now our marriage is condemned because you, you offended the, our marriage covenant. It's all over with. They don't say that. Nobody's married says that. If they, if they say that, they're not, they shouldn't be saying that. When a mom and dad, when something happens in the family, do they stop becoming a husband and wife, mom and dad, children? No. What's offered up? An apology. An apology. I am sorry. Forgive me. I confess what I did was wrong. It should have never happened. Please forgive me. That's exactly what happens in 1 John 1, 9. If we confess our sins, what does that mean? That means you owe up to it. You call it what it is. You acknowledge it. You recognize that it's wrong. You let God know that it's wrong. And you say, Father, forgive me. And it's gone. Now, in the Christian world, people don't understand this. And they have this idea that if a Christian sins, the moment they sin, they're out back into condemnation again. As soon as they say, forgive me, they're back over here under grace again. So they're in and out of grace, in and out of under the law all the time. That's how they see it. But you need to remember when you're justified by the blood of Jesus, justified by faith in Christ Jesus, the cross of Jesus Christ, his blood spans from the womb to the tomb. From the cradle to the grave. It spans your whole life. Before you became a Christian, the moment you became a Christian, and when after you became a Christian. It covered all those sins and washed them and wiped them away. So much so that the law can never condemn you. That's why it says in Romans 8.1, Therefore there is now no condemnation to those who are in Christ Jesus. When the believer sins, he doesn't come under the condemnation of the law. He has done something worse. He has offended someone that he loves. When you know anything about hurting someone that you love, you know how terrible it is. It is so terrible. That's why a Christian cringes inside when they know they failed the Lord. They wish to God that it had never, ever happened. And they're so ashamed of themselves. The person under the condemnation of the law is never ashamed of himself. All he's ever looking to do is to justify himself. Can you see that? Okay. 
So we have this person who's sick almost unto death, and it says here that I'm trying to find it in my scriptures here. Verse 27, indeed he was sick almost unto death, but God had mercy upon him, and not only on him, but on me also, lest I should have sorrow after sorrow, or sorrow upon sorrow. Now this verse of scripture right here, if people would look at it and accept it for what it says, it would have discarded all the false notions that are in the body of Christ regarding God healing people and regarding the idea, well, if I just have enough faith, I can be healed. Or regarding the idea that we have a right to claim healing. If this phrase right here, but God had mercy upon him, wasn't in the Bible, all those things might have a leg to stand up. But this one verse is such a bulldozer because here the Apostle Paul is saying, he, watch what he's not saying. There's no mention here that we're standing on the word, is there? There's no mention here that we are confessing scriptures, is there? If all of that that has been brought into Christianity is really truthful, then something about that would be said right here. But none of it's said. A lot of times I go on what's not said as much as what is said. Here we find that this person, nearly sick unto death, God had mercy upon him. And it deals with the false idea that God is obligated to heal you if you have enough faith. It deals with the false idea that sickness is always a result of sin or a lack of faith. Like that one person said, if, you, if you, you're sick and you're not getting healed, it's because you got sin in your life, you just don't know it. Well, like I said before, you look at this man's life. Where is the heart in this man that would refuse repenting? Everything about him is giving himself over to the things of God. You can't find that. And Paul never brought it up. He brought it up with the Corinthian church, didn't he? He says, there's many sick and weakly and falling asleep among you because of the way you're treating the communion table which, and, and, and actually how you're treating each other at, uh, when that is served. But he doesn't even bring any of that up to, about him at all. Now, no doubt Paul was praying for him. And no doubt Paul knowing that a person could be sick and weakly and even fall asleep among us, that he knows it's a result of not judging ourselves. And this person is in close communion with Paul. No doubt Paul talked to him about all these things, if indeed there was anything like that for him to be concerned about. And that was not the concern here at all. So that means that a person, if a person's sick, it doesn't necessarily mean that they sinned or that God is judging them. And it doesn't mean that they don't have enough faith. Now, there's the Apostle Paul. Do you think he's a man of faith? When you go through the Bible, you see him being mightily used by God. But there's no indication here that he's mightily used by God. Now, there was a short season in my life that God used me to heal some people. Some people were healed. And it got out, and there were people wanting to come over to my house, wanting to meet with me, thinking that I had this gift of healing that I could just turn on and off and get them healed. And it never happened. No human being ever healed another human being. God heals people. And God's not obligated to heal people because the Scripture says He had mercy upon them. So all these false ideas regarding Faith and confession regarding healing. False ideas and notions about if you're sick, it's because you sinned. All these false notions, the reason why you're not healed is because you don't have enough faith, are all blown out of the water right here. The reason why this man was sick for as long as he was, was not because he sinned and not because he didn't have enough faith, but because during that interim period, God, for his own purposes, did not choose to show him mercy during that time. But there came a time that God decided to show him mercy, and he was healed. Can you see that, everybody? It's so simple. God had mercy. No doubt Epiritus prayed. No doubt Paul prayed. No doubt the Christians in that area were praying. 
But this is something interesting. There's no mention about who prayed and who didn't pray or how they prayed or someone gave a word. None of that was mentioned. I always go by a lot of what I don't see. I hear all this stuff preached and all this stuff mentioned, and I go to my Bible and I don't see it. So why is all this stuff being said if it's not here? So I go to the Word of God and I don't see those things there. These people simply recognize that it was God and Him alone who chose to show mercy, and God alone who was to receive the glory for the mercy that He showed. We have to understand that if someone is healed and you prayed for that person, that you were merely a vessel that God used. That's all you were. When I take a spoon to put food in my mouth and it makes me happy, I don't praise the spoon. I thank God for the mouth that he gave me to enjoy it with. Right? God gets all the glory. If God uses you, don't think anything more of you than you did before he used you. It's like Billy called me up and he said, Pastor, I just feel so unworthy. And I says, well, join the party. I said, every Christian I know feels that way. I don't know a Christian in my whole, I don't know any Christian that's really a Christian that feels worthy. He's just listening like, boy, is that really true? He says, yeah. I says, you're not supposed to feel worthy. The Bible says, blessed are those who are poor in spirit and blessed are those who mourn. What do you think you're mourning about? Because you see how unworthy you are of all the goodness of God's grace. And I said, by the way, if you weren't unworthy, you'd have to take the word grace and rip it out of the Bible. It doesn't belong in the Bible anymore because the word grace in and of itself indicates that you're unworthy and God is worthy. You're unworthy and God is worthy. That you are unrighteous, but God is righteous. Grace is just saying that you're the person that God finds the problems with and God's the person that finds that he is the answer for those problems. Grace. Pretty wonderful, isn't it? Like I said on Wednesday night, just be like the donkey. God ever uses you like the donkey that carried Jesus on Palm Sunday? That donkey didn't go back to the stable and say, did you see who I was carrying today? And start strutting around the stable. No, he just went back there and kept on talking like a donkey, acting like a donkey. He didn't act like he was a special donkey. And you're not to act like you're a special Christian because you laid hands on somebody and God did something wonderful. If anything, you ought to just say, oh, Lord, have mercy on me that you would use a person such as me. See, in the charismatic world, if God uses somebody, oh, the almighty preacher. We got to go hear him. That's the idea. You become somebody spectacular. But if you become somebody spectacular, you begin talking like you're somebody spectacular, then you're preaching yourself and not preaching Christ. And you're, just, you're doing just the opposite of what the Spirit of God would do. The Spirit of God brings no glory or honor to himself. And if he's not bringing any glory and honor to himself, surely he's not going to bring any glory and, and honor to you. He's going to bring glory and honor to the Lord Jesus Christ. And if you bring glory and honor to yourself, don't be surprised if he's not using you. Don't be surprised if he sets you aside and you're wondering, why isn't anything happening with my life? Because God isn't going to, uh, God's spirit is not going to allow somebody to go on and on and on and on like that. You say, why, Pastor, isn't he going to do that? Because grace is reigning. Let me just close, because this is in my heart. Grace is reigning. In the Bible, you've got two things that are, are said to be reigning. You've got sin reigning through death. You got grace reigning through righteousness. When something's reigning, it's showing its strength. Sin reigns by showing its strength through death and through the fruits of the, uh, or the works of the flesh or the fruits of death. That's how sin reigns. When grace reigns, it reigns through righteousness. What's the first instance in your life that you found grace reigning? It was the moment you were born again. The moment you came to faith. That was grace reigning through righteousness. How did grace ever begin to reign through righteousness? Well, it began because of righteousness. It began because on the cross, there is our Savior righteously redeeming us and providing righteous grace 
to reign through righteousness. And so when, right, when grace began to reign, all of a sudden, what did it do? It brought you into relationship with God. What else did it do? It caused you to be, caused, it, caused Christ's righteousness to be imputed unto you, and now you're clothed with righteousness. So far, what have you done to, for any of this to happen? Nothing. nothing. And is grace all done reigning? Oh, I'm all done reigning. I have nothing else to do now. I'm all done. No, no. Grace is so determined that God's will will be accomplished for those who Jesus purchased on the cross, that that grace begins to reign in righteousness regarding your personal life. Have you noticed your personal life has been changing since you became a Christian? Now, it's not what we like to see it all be yet, is it? Because you're not going to be able to see what you really want to see until glorification comes. But aren't you glad you've been seeing what you have been seeing? Isn't it good that grace is reigning? Well, you know how else grace reigns? Grace also reigns according to the Word of God through the gifts of the Spirit. Now, if grace reigns through righteousness, brings us into a relationship with God we had nothing to do with, if grace reigns through righteousness and shows its strength by transforming and changing our life, if grace is, and we had nothing to do with that, we can't claim that I'm where I'm at today compared to where I was 10 years ago because of me. No, we, we're, we're like Paul. I am what I am by the grace of God, right? So in the book of Acts, it talks about that there was great grace upon the people. And when it talks about great grace upon the people, it's saying it in the context of how God was, Christ was manifesting his spirit and his power among the people. So there's another way that grace reigns. Grace will reign through the operations of the Spirit. And that's where you get the word charis, charisma or charismatic out of 1 Corinthians 12. It's all these different graces. These, the grace of God wants to manifest itself through a word of knowledge, through a word of wisdom, through a tongue, through interpretation of tongue, through uh, healing, through a working of a miracle. But notice when grace is reigning like that, it's always, grace is always reigning under the Lordship of Jesus Christ. He's in control of that grace that wants to reign. And anytime grace reigns and does what it does, can you brag about it? Well, I'm a Christian. I made myself a Christian. No, grace is reigning, so you just feel so foolish to say anything like that. My life has really changed. You can't boast about that. Say, My life has changed. I'm so grateful to the Lord for that. And when a manifestation of the Spirit of God comes, is it because there's a great preacher in the house? No, there's a great Savior in the house. And he causes his grace to reign, to show, to show its strength in a righteous manner by manifesting God's mercy and his goodness to his people. And that's what happened over here with Eparitus. Grace was reigning, and God showed mercy. And in God showing mercy, he was healed. And nobody can take the credit for it but God and God alone. Can you say amen? amen. Then we close by saying this. He says in verse 28, Therefore I send him the more eagerly, that when you see him again you may rejoice, and I may be less sorrowful. Why would he be less sorrowful? Because you're happy. You ever think about a person being less sorrowful because he sees the joy in another person? Why was he sorrowful? Because he knew they needed some help and he was hurting over them needing help. And the help that they needed was Eparitis, somebody that he also needed. It's really amazing when grace is reigning and helps you to see the need of another person above your own need. Verse 29, Receive him therefore in the Lord with all gladness, and hold such men in esteem. It's amazing. What kind of people do we hold in esteem? The people that are bragging on themselves? Or the people who have the interest of Christ? The people who have the interest of Christ are looking after the needs of God's people. He says in verse 30, For because of the work of Christ, talking about Ephoritus who became sick and God healed, because of the work of Christ, he came close to death. Boy, whatever was going on in his body was difficult, wasn't it? 
He became close to, get, to, to, to death. And watch this now. He kind of shows you the reason why he came close to death. Not regarding his life. Why wasn't he regarding his life? To supply what was lacking in your service towards me. In other words, that's not a condemnation to them. They just were not able to. So that he came as their representative to supply service to him. So he was serving, serving the Apostle Paul. And serving him with such diligence that it affected his health in a negative way. And you can go through church history and you can read about ministers that gave themselves for the sake of lost souls and gave themselves for their church, so much so that it affected their health. Now, when you read that phrase, because of the work of Christ, he came close to death. Does it say because of his sin? He came close to death? So the next time someone looks at you and says, ah, ha, ha, well, maybe you got some little secret sin in your life. You say, ah, ha, 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 maybe you should shut your mouth. <laughs> because there's a fellow in the Bible that came close to death because of his service to God. And maybe other ministers have come close to death because of their service to God. And maybe other Christians have come close to death because of their service to God. And maybe you came close to death because of your service to God. And maybe it had nothing, absolutely nothing to do with you having a lack of faith. It had absolutely nothing to do with anything. And I always think of my brother Dave. My brother Dave, when he, when he died, I went to see him and he was crying. You know what he was crying about? He wasn't crying because he was dying. He was crying because I don't have enough faith to be healed. And he was so under condemnation. He was so beating us up. And he was dying of cancer. He was already hurting enough. But because of the teaching, now he's hurting himself more. Because I just can't get myself out of this. Isn't that sad? And so we don't want to accommodate those kinds of teachings. You will accommodate those kinds of teachings if you don't travel through the Bible verse by verse. If you hip scotch around, you can make the Bible say anything you care to make it say. But if you go through the Bible verse by verse, you're not going to get away with that kind of nonsense. Let's all stand to our feet. Praise the Lord forevermore. Precious Heavenly Father, we love you and we worship you and we thank you, Father, that you, in the goodness and the kindness of your heart, you're keeping us from living superficial lives as Christians. But Lord, you're helping us to live spiritual lives as Christian. Lives, Lord, that are becoming more and more rooted and grounded in the truth of your word. Lives, Lord, that are enjoying more and more the grace of God abounding. Lord, for your namesake and for your honor, may your grace always find itself abounding in our lives for your namesake, bringing glory, honor, blessing, and pleasure to your heart. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Love you all.